Today we're starting a brand new series that we're calling The End of Me. It is from a book title written by Kyle Eidelman. Kyle is an author and pastor and, and does a great job. And, and I love Kyle's books. I love his just, his just kind of down-to-earth way of looking at things. And he's super insightful. And whenever we do books like this, I always say this. First of all, I encourage you to get a book. Uh, we don't have free ones to pass out, but you can go on Amazon. Just type in the end of me book. It's a red one. It's super encouraging. I encourage you to get it. But also, too, I always say this. We are not replacing the Bible with some book, okay? We're using a book like this as a springboard into a specific situation or a specific subject, and we're going to process that subject with the Bible. Now, here we go. The subject, really the question I wanted you to process in this whole series is what does it mean to die to yourself? What does it mean to die to yourself? Or, or another way of saying it is what does it mean to come to the end of yourself. We're going to talk about that over the next four weeks, but for today, start with the big point. I know a lot of people out there like, Chris, I got a lot of things in my mind. I got things to do. Give me the big point so I can get in and get out of here. That's fine. Here's the big point to respect you. When we come to the end of ourselves, real life begins. When you come to the end of yourself, real life begins. Now, I'm going to say this. I think that that sounds a little like, eh, you know, like nice, but does not really sound very, very, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't sound really, really encouraging. And, and it really, I'm telling you what, this, this idea, this phrase, it usually, it usually doesn't happen in a really nice, easy, comfortable way. It does not feel good ever, actually, in my life. It's like someone saying this. It's like you hiking a really long hike or going up a really, like, tall hill, and at the very end, someone says, and now we can begin. <laughs> and you're like, I just got up the hill. I'm done. I don't want to do anymore. I'm just done. Now, now it made me think about this phrase, okay? And that, and that phrase has hit me. I want you to be honest, okay? Anyone in the room in the last week, okay, or online, I'm watching those hands, okay? Anyone in the last week, have you caught yourself saying out loud or in your mind the phrase, I'm done? Anybody? I'm done, all right? Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of hands, okay? A lot of hands are representing in the room. And we all have our different contexts of what we mean by that. But there's a, there's a time in our lives, I know my life too, this past week, almost daily recently, where I was, I'm like, I'm done. I'm just done. And I want to encourage you with this big picture visual. When you're at that point of, I'm just done, picture God leaning in saying, good. Now we can begin. Now we can start. Let me help you now. Let me carry you through this. See, everyone knows that this idea of, of just the, a big point of just the idea of you coming to the end of yourself and real life beginning, it's all, good, it's all good stuff. In the real world, it doesn't work that way, right? But in God's kingdom, it is a central premise, a central idea. This is what it's all about, this idea of you and I coming to the end of ourself in a real life beginning. We see it over and over in the Gospels, those who decide to, to, to encounter Jesus or follow Jesus, a few things happen. The, the things that they value most important are put on the line in front of Jesus. And then what Jesus does, and, and he says this, listen, if you want to accept the new life I want to give you, you have to let go of those most precious things you're holding on to, those most precious, precious even truths or ideas or, or agendas. you got to let it go and trust me, he says, that I have something better for you, something bigger for you. You see it with the Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus in Luke 19 realizes that he may have status, privilege, money, but he's spiritually bankrupt. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've been there. You've had all the stuff. You made it be a point to get all the stuff. You thought it would be so good when you have all the stuff. But once you have all the stuff, you realize you got nothing inside. And you're just empty. And you're hurting. Or maybe like Mary and Martha in John 11. They realize that even though God didn't spare them the pain of losing their brother, that God taught them something to depend on him even in a deeper way. Or, or maybe even the woman at the well in John 4 realized that her lifestyle was leaving her empty. And maybe that's you. Your lifestyle you're realizing is leaving you empty. 
and that you can't hide behind just, just questions all the time without really pursuing answers meaningfully. Time and time again, Jesus comes face to face with what we think we know about life, and he turns it upside down. He just does it all the time. And I think he does it unapologetically. He's like, oh, that's nice. Whoop, turns it upside down. At all time. In my life, and I, I thought about this, kid, and this is what it is. We see a specific situation, and we are convinced that the way we see it is truth. And that's what I'm talking about, what, what the things that we hold on to. We, we see a specific subject or situation, and we, can, we tell ourselves, man, we, it is truth. It is truth. And then God goes, oh, you're so pretty, but we're going to do something different. See, he sees your lowercase t truth, my lowercase t truth, and he has a different perspective. And what he does, he turns it upside down. For example, take this guy. This guy's got a great beard, okay? A great beard, all right? And I don't know what he's sad about. That's a great beard. Maybe he's sad because he's bald. Hey, bald is beautiful. Can I get an amen on that, okay? Amen. Anybody? Okay, good. <laughs> bald is beautiful, all right? But I don't know why he's, why he's discouraged, and he's looking kind of down. But if you look at this picture, if you flip it around, boom, you got this guy. He's happy. It's the same picture. It's just flipped around. And, and he's a happy guy. He's pumped about life. It's a different perspective. See, it's the same subject or truth, just seen from a different perspective. It's the two identical pictures just flipped around. Or how about this, okay? This is from Jeep. Uh, Jeep had, had an ad campaign a few years ago. And uh, you can't see it on the very bottom, though. It's a super tiny font. But what it says is, it says, see whatever you want to see. See whatever you want to see. Now, when you see it, I I'm hoping to ask you, do you see the giraffe, the giraffe head? But if you turn it upside down, you see a cute little penguin. It's just super cute, you know? It's just the same exact subject, the same exact picture, the same exact lowercase t truth, just seen from a different perspective. And here's the point again. Jesus comes face to face with what we think we know about life, and he turns it upside down all the time. Let me ask you this. Is there a subject? Is there, is there a lowercase t truth? Is there a political agenda? Is there something you're holding on to so tightly that it's actually leading you away from God instead of toward God? And that's the great question to ask yourself. Is this subject, is this thing I hold so tightly to, is it leading me to Jesus or making me feeling even more distant away from him? So alone and isolated, so angry, frustrated, so mad. Friends, I'm telling you what, that's a great clarifying question. If it's not leading you to Jesus, you might need to let go not hold so tightly. See, maybe you need to let go of it and let Jesus show you a different perspective. And when it comes to different perspectives, Jesus makes it clear that he has a specific different perspective in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. This is one of his most famous sermons. Uh, he basically, I, I know you picture maybe like him sitting on like, you know, the, the Matterhorn at Disneyland or something at the very top of it, like, listen, people. It was less like that. And I, I've, I've actually been to Israel and saw this area where most likely would have happened. He was just kind of on a hillside. And, and here he is just gathering people and, and, and really speaking to them on this hillside. And, and, and what he's doing, he's saying, hey, look, listen, huddle up. He got a little, bit of, a little bit of like early fame. People are like, this guy's so encouraging. He's so good. Man, I want to follow this guy. This guy has it all together. He's all, huddle up, huddle up. Okay, we're going to go ahead and talk for just a little bit, okay, of what it means to follow me. And, 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 I, and even though he didn't say these words, I'm going to say the paraphrase, you're not going to like it. You're not going to like it. It's going to surprise you. It's going to turn a lot of things upside down. And so just get ready. And, 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 and they're, I see them going, yeah, bring it, Jesus, bring it, right? And, and they want to hear everything he has to say. And, and what he does in the very beginning, he has what's called the Beatitudes. These are blessings given to people when they really have a, have a, have a show a, a certain type of heart or characteristic. And, and what he does, he gives us a glimpse of the kingdom values of Jesus. The kingdom values what matter most to him. And they all have to do with coming to the end of yourself. They all have to do with you and I saying, okay, I'm done. You take over. 
Now, if you go through the Beatitudes and boil them down, the heart issue is that no one can get away without having their toes stepped on in some way. There's going to be some subject, something we're passionate about, that Jesus is going to go, I'm going to turn upside down. Something. And it's going to be something that hits us out of the blue. And a lot of of times for me, I think to myself, no, I agree with everything he's saying. And all of a sudden, he says something like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And, and, and I want to just say, like, when I first read that, I go, what? And even though I'm a pastor, read the Bible for years, I've broken down this thing, read different commentaries, I still look at it and go, really? You're going to put the keys of the kingdom in the hands of those who are kind of don't have it all together? Don't you, I mean, shouldn't you put the keys of the kingdom for, in, in the hands of those who do have it all together? To have, have, some, have some resources, you know? Have, some, have some, some health. Have maybe some wealth. Maybe some influence. You want those people, because that's what we see in the world, right? That's what we see on TV. That's what we see in the movies. These are the people, the people that have it all together or have the good looks or have the resources. They're the ones that are driving the ship, not the poor in spirit, whatever that means. Now, the poor in spirit would be those who seem like they don't have it all together, the poor in spirit would be those people who are stuck, useless, helpless. Why would Jesus say something like this? I like the way the message paraphrases it when it says this. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With, with less of you, there's more of God and his rule. Now it's starting to make a little more sense. Less of me more of him. The beauty of what Jesus does when he calls us to end or come to the end of ourselves, it's not an invitation to suicide, just to be very blunt. It's not. It's an invitation for you to stop running the show. For you to stop declaring what capital T truth is. For you to start saying, what does Jesus have to say about this? What does Jesus have to say about this? And what's beautiful about this, when you and I come to the end of ourselves, and we go, Chris, if I come to the end of myself, what am I going to do? Well, what's great about it, the beauty is that Jesus makes up the difference. He picks up from there, which is so wonderful. And that's how he built his kingdom, the one that we're a part of today. He took broken people and made them whole. He took broken people and made them whole. He took what seemed to be a broken plan, and he changed the whole world with it. And the evidence of that point is in the room right now. I'm going to ask this person to stand up real quick. Ready? Here we go. The evidence of brokenness. Going from broken to being made made whole. The evidence of God using someone to make a difference even with their brokenness, is in the room right now. I'm going to ask you all to please stand for just a moment. And give each other a round of applause right now, okay? <laughs> you grab a seat. You go, Chris, why am I applauding myself? I should be applauding God. Well, of course, but here's the attaboy and atta girl to you. You came to the end of yourself eventually and said, God, take up the rest. Take it from here. And and here's the thing, too, about being a Christian. It's not something that happened just one time in your life. You can't say, well, I did it back when I was 20, back when I was 13, back when I was a little four-year-old. I said, Jesus, I love you. God, I come into my life. I I, I love those stories. But if you're going to be a real, and again, in my opinion, a real follower of Jesus, Chris, those are strong words, a real follower of Jesus. (laughs) I'm sorry. Take it up with Jesus. But you and I have to come to this point daily. Amen? Where we're like, we come to the end of ourselves daily. We wake up and go, I'm done. Chris, what's the evidence of that? When Jesus says, take up your cross daily. That's what that means. Friend, early this week, we we posted a a statement on social media, and we asked people to finish the statement. By the way, if you're not on social media, I, I respect that. But if you, if you want some encouragement, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook. We, get, we do daily, daily posts to encourage people. 
And, and, and I believe it's good. And Cameron and Anna and Moritz, they've been helping us lead that. You're going to see them on the stage one day, too, on the Difference Maker season. And you can be a part of that help them, too. But they posted this really great little statement. It says this, Jesus became real for me when? When did Jesus become real for you? And the common denominator that I see in all of these comments or phrases is that, is that they all came to the end of themselves in some way. That's when Jesus became real. Here's what people said, I realized I couldn't do it without him. Jesus became real when I finally surrendered my life to him and realized that he had never abandoned me. Jesus became real for me when he saw me, not my sin, and I understood that. Jesus became real for me when I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. Jesus became real for me somehow I just fell in love with him, just being near him. Jesus became real for me when he performed miracles in my life. He became real for me when he delivered me from an impossible situation. Jesus became real for me when I stopped my egotistical behavior and decided to listen. And finally, Jesus became real for me when I was in junior high and my parents got divorced. Friends, if we want to come to the end of ourselves, then we need to begin again with Jesus. I put the again in there on purpose. It's again, every day, again. Every day, again. We don't ever get to a point where we start coasting. But Chris, I want to coast. I want to put it on cruise control and coast. That's all I want to do. That's all I want to do. And friend, I know that. That's my, that's my, I know that. That's my flesh too. I just want to coast. You know, I don't want to have to deal with all of this. I don't want to have to try so hard. And I want you to understand, it's not trying hard. It's actually the opposite. It's you coming to a point saying, Again, I'm done. And God leaning in saying, good, let me help you. Friend, when Jesus chose his disciples, the end of me process began for each of them. And we see it walked out in the Bible. We see these schmoes, and by the way, they are schmoes. They're a bunch of men and women who make bonehead decisions just like, guess what, we do, right? And what's so good about the Bible, and this is one reason why I believe it's true. I don't think it's all just lame. I think it's true because of the schmoness effect. Because if, if they were all written with great stories, and they had happy marriages, and they never, they never cussed. Oh, God. <laughs> they, they never saw a radar movie. Oh, God. You know, what I, I would say, bull pucky. No way. There's no way. But because you see the humanity in their lives, it gives me hope. I can relate. These guys are schmoes. Well, guess what? Chris, they were schmoes before Christ. No, they were schmoes after Christ, too. Peter was a schmo big time after Christ. Messing up often. And I'm telling you what, guys, it's a part of being a believer. And a part of you and I every, every day going, you know what? I'm done with me trying again. God, I want to trust you now. Friends, today, I want to give you a few beginning points. Just three beginning points, Okay. Here we go. Beginning point number one. The end of me is the beginning of trust. The beginning of trust. Chris, I'd love some scripture right now when you got it. Here it comes. All right? Boom. In Luke 7, it's one of my favorite stories. It says this. And this is the story of this. It's often called the story of Jesus and the immoral woman. Or the immoral woman, you know, puts the perfume on Jesus' feet. Let's dive into it. Okay? One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner. We know this guy's name is Simon. A dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. You go, Chris, awesome. Who cares? Okay, (laughs) great. Let me just process this a little bit. Jesus is invited by this Pharisee to come to dinner at the Pharisee's house. Why is that important? The Pharisee, collectively the group, is a a bunch of religious muckety-mucks. They're all about rules. They're all about you will get a good life if you obey the rules and check the marks. Good things will happen to you. You'll be a good person. What does that sound like? Religion. Don't raise your hands on on this one, but how many of us have been burned by religion? Just burned, buried by it. To be shamed by it. This Pharisee represents that group. Not all of them, but the majority of them rolled that way. Chris, they're the enemy, right? No, Jesus talked to the Pharisees more than anyone else. He loved them. They were so close, but they missed it in the rule category. It's not about rules. It's about a relationship with God. Amen? 
Amen, yeah. So keep going. So, so he goes, Jesus, come over to my house. And Jesus says, okay, now picture this scene. Jesus just, wa- he walks in. Now in the Jewish culture, there would be c- customs that we wouldn't know, okay? So maybe when someone comes to your house, maybe you give them a high five, you give them a hug, you're like, where's my Amazon package? You know, whatever it is. You know, you're like, you're trying to, you, you have a certain way that you kind of bring people in. Well, in the Jewish culture, they were very hospitable. They had people over all the time, doors and windows open, great weather, you know, no ACs. And, and if there was any kind of party happening, people walk by and go, oh, party, and come on in. That's pretty normal. Now, what happens here, Jesus, you know, Pharisee, come over to dinner. We don't know why he's inviting Jesus to dinner. He, maybe he's trying to set him up. Maybe he's trying to ridicule him. Maybe he's actually trying to ask him questions. I don't know. We don't know. But this guy does something. Well, actually, to be more, more frank, he doesn't do something. And it's telling in this moment. When you see Jesus sit down and have dinner with him, there was a big missing chunk here that we're not seeing. If Jesus walked in and did this, hey, Simon, okay. That's how we're going to roll? (laughs) Okay, let's do it. What should have happened in that moment is three things. Number one, there should have been Simon coming up and saying, Jesus, and giving a little customary kiss. Not a make-out friendship kiss, okay, just a little bit, you know, whatever type of thing. That would be a normal little welcome way to do, you know, when someone comes over your house. Not creepy, very acceptable. Number two thing would have been, they don't have awesome shoes that we have. They, have. they don't have awesome streets. They have dirt and everything. So what it would have been a little bit of cold water poured on that person's feet. Oh, Jesus, let me, let me get you some water. Hold on. Just pour on their feet, kind of cool them down, you know, kind of clean them up a little bit. And, and then what also would have been done, too, is, hey, you know what? Let me just grab a little bit of this. Some perfume, some incense, you know, whatever. Like, you're kind of like... You know, just kind of dropped, you know, on his head, on the person's head to make them smell good. Chris, why is that kind of creepy? Because they didn't have deodorant back then, okay? They, they didn't. And I know we walked through a season of shutdown, you know, last year when we didn't need to ever brush our teeth ever again. We didn't have to wear deodorant. We lived the good life for a few months, you know. But then we came out of hibernation, out of exile, and we came out of that whole shutdown, and we act, interacted with people again. It was like, oh, I'm going to brush my teeth now. You know, now I'm going to wear deodorant again. That's what they were doing. They're trying to say, hey, here's some perfume put on you because you're coming into my home. I smell, you smell, let's be real. How about we smell good instead of bad? Those three things did not happen. Jesus is like, okay, all right, okay. Let's just do this thing, let's do this thing. Let's sit down. Now, what also happens in the scene, because again, doors are open, windows are open, people walking by, whatever, someone comes in. Now, this someone is described by the author of this as an immoral woman. And I really believe the description is put in there not because of the author, but because of the culture and how the culture would see this woman walking in. She's an immoral woman, and that is code for, get this, slut prostitute. Just straight up. I'm sorry. There's no way to say it. She, 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 this is her profession. This is what she does. Now, I'm not saying, I don't understand why. I don't know why. And a lot of times you know, we hear people from Rachel, there's horrible reasons. And why people get involved in these types of situations, abuse, being abandoned, looking to try to provide an income, anything. And what she does is something that's so remarkable. She makes a beeline for Jesus with her alabaster jar. Alabaster jar, what do you mean by that? It's kind of like a Winnie the Pooh jar. I kind of feel like that, you know, that's how I see it. And actually, we don't know how big the jar is. It could have been big. It could have been a small little thing around their neck that they would use. And they go, who they, Chris? Prostitutes. They'd have the perfume there. Chris, what, what, what's, the, what's the deal with the prostitute having the perfume around her neck? Again, not to get too creepy or too detailed, but the life that she was in, okay? The life that she was in. She, she would, imagine going man to man to man, or whomever, and going, I, you know what, now I have to get the smell off of me. I have to get this, this just, this, I have to erase the scene from my, from my mind. I have to just put it behind me. And the best way to do that, what we saw in a customary way, was to have a, a little vile perfume. Just to put on yourself. To get the smell of the person off of you. Try to move on. Now, this alabaster jar, this perfume connection, Chanel number no. five, okay? It's a pretty popular perfume. And you go, Chris, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm not a big perfume person. I don't know how much that would cost. Well, let's just say a 32-ounce, you know, drink at, like, you know, at Qu- Quick Stop, you know, or a Circle K. You know, 32 ounce, say that's full of perfume instead of, like, you know, Sprite, Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, whatever. 
And if a 32 ounce uh, perfume, a Chanel number no. five, would cost $1,000. $1,000. And we don't know how big the, 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 the jar is that she brought in. We don't know. It could have been the honey, you know, the, the Winnie the Pooh honey jar. Or it could have been a little small one. But all I know is this. It has two significant points of value. The first value is, yeah, monetary. It's got actual cash value to it. There would be people in the room seeing what she's about to do, which is going to be break it, spoiler alert, on Jesus, and go, <gasps> waste of money. It'd be like dumping out Chanel number five on like your dog. You're, Chris, I love my dog. I know, but that's a lot of money, okay, on a dog. It's a lot of money. It just, it just, it just what's happening here? There's that value. But the other value that is significant here was this item represents something so special to her. It was the subject in her life, the lowercase true in her, truth in her life, that, 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 that she held on to, I believe, to get through the crap. At least I got this. I have no control of my life. I'm used and abused constantly, but I've got this, and it helps me get through the crap. She knelt behind him, Jesus, at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet. She wiped them off and with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. In this moment, she just felt like she was in the presence of someone I could only imagine that she trusted. To be vulnerable. Because you, you, you don't act this way unless you can very much trust that person. You, you don't give and replace something you hold so precious. You don't give that up for something less precious. You give it up for something more important. You would never do that unless you trusted the person. And, and by the way, I don't believe America or the world has a belief problem with Jesus. Because, yeah, they don't believe. They're throwing him out of school. They're throwing, throwing him out of the courts. They don't have a, a problem believing. It's not a belief issue. It's a trust issue. They don't trust Jesus. And you go, well, Chris, they should read their Bible. How about they read you? How about they read me? How about they see Jesus in us? How about we create an environment for them where they don't feel like the immoral woman or the immoral man, and they just feel love? Providing a safe place for them to let go of the things, the addictions, the hobbies, the, the passions, whatever you want to call it, that have gotten them through it, to give up those things and replace them with Jesus. You will only do that, I believe, if you trust Jesus more than the other stuff. And what she does here is something that Simon the Pharisee did not do. She could have easily said, hey, Simon, do you have any, you, you know what, I, I, Jesus, hold on, I want to just, I just like, do something really special. Simon, do you have any water? Do you have any water, Simon's cold water? She doesn't do that. She just uses her tears. She could have said, Simon, do you have any nice towels I can use to kind of wipe down the feet a little bit? Do you have anything like that? And he, she doesn't do that. She just lets down her hair. Also, huge cultural significance. You let down the hair, that's an intimate thing. Let's that down. And just starts using her hair to wipe and clean his feet. And then she takes that jar, that significant something, breaks it, and says, I don't want it anymore. That's what she was saying. She wasn't just blessing Jesus with some nice smelly stuff. She's saying, I'm, gonna go ahead. I'm not going back. I'm giving this to you. I'm no longer having my jar of perfume be my thing that gets me through. Now it's you, Jesus. You get me through. See, the end of me is the beginning of trust. After this, number two, the end of me is the beginning of a new identity. New identity comes once you trust, once you learn to do that. You stop trying to find your identity in what you do. Oh, here we go. Friends, come on now. Come on. Don't we find our, our identity in so much of what we do, which is so sad, but it's so human. Some of us find our identity in wanting to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It starts really young. We find, want to have our identity, you know, in dressing the right way, identifying with a certain group. We want to have, find our identity in maybe in our marriage or having kids or not having kids. We find, want to have our identity found in what we do, our actual jobs. I'm a stay-at-home dad, stay-at-home mom, I'm a lawyer, I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm a teacher. Or we find these jobs offered to us and we go, no, that's beneath me. Why is it beneath you? Let's be honest. It's not just your gift mix. 
There's a part of you that goes, I don't want to be identified with that. I don't want to be identified with that type of job. No. I want something more that feeds my identity and who I think I should be. And what's so such a bummer when people retire, they struggle for the first little season because they were so attached to their job, finding their identity in the job. But what's wonderful, once they get past that season, they realize that with retirement, you can golf like every day. It's awesome, okay? <laughs> and you can watch movies and stuff and have and, you know, no one can bother you. It's great, all right? But anywho, this idea of identity, if you are struggling with identity right now, can I just tell you something? This is not a, I won't do a full sermon on it, but I'll say this. If you are trying to figure out who you are, and I know our world loves to give you all sorts of advice, can I just give you this advice, and you can just take it or leave it. Um, stop trying to find your identity uh, in, in other people, in what you do, or even in your own self. If you want to find your identity, just go to God. Go to God. And what you do is you, you, you go, okay, okay, Chris, like, go to God, God, help me with my identity. No, no, no. Go to God and look at who he says he is. Because you and I will find our identity once we figure out who he is. For example, if God is the creator, we are the creation. If God is the savior, then we are the ones who need to be saved. If God is the father, then we are the what? His children. That's who you are. Not a manager, not a doctor, not a teacher, not a divorce A, not a loser. Not an addict. These are not who you are. Not all the stupid divisions that I'm rattling them off my mind, uh, what, our, what our world's doing right now. But I'll keep my mouth shut. We are not those things. We find our identity in who God is. Amen? When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus to come over saw all of this, he said to himself, mind you on that, he said to himself, the Pharisee did, big God, big God in the flesh, Jesus is like, oh, I'm God. <laughs> I can read your mind. <laughs> anyway, so, so Jesus hears what he's thinking, and he thinks to himself this, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Now, here's an example of someone trying to throw an identity onto someone else. Oh, does that ever happen in our world? All the time. You know, I, I think you're this. Boom. And we don't just do that in political realms. We do that in our homes. You're a loser. You're a failure. You keep messing up. You keep doing that. We do that so often. Making us feel or others feel less. And this woman is being called a straight-up sinner. She's a sinner. She's not a human, this Pharisee. She is a sinner, an immoral woman. And what Jesus is trying to do in this moment, by letting her come, by letting her be there. You go, Chris, yeah, why was she by her feet? Or by his feet? They reclined at the table back then. And here he is reclining at the table, and she comes to his feet and just loses it. And he lets it happen. Could you imagine if a prostitute came to your office tomorrow morning? Hi, I'm looking for Chris. I'm looking for, uh, for JC. I'm looking for, uh, for uh, Heather, for Jad. You know, I'm looking for Miles. You know, a prostitute? You'd be like, oh, uh, no, I'm not here. You know, somewhere else. You know, it's like, you, you don't want to be associated with that at all. Jesus could have been like, get off me, woman. But he doesn't. He lets her do what she does, this expression of love, because he wants to help her understand something very simple and clear. You are not trash. You are treasure. That's who you are. You are treasure. And so many of us right now, so many of you watching online, so many of you in the room, you are beating yourself up. And that's what shame does. And that is a strategy from the enemy himself to make you and I feel like trash. But when we come to the end of ourselves, we are met with a new identity. Where Jesus says, oh, my child, you've been running so hard, trying to prove to so many, so many things. If you would just stop, and I'm so glad you finally have, because here I am to tell you, you are not trash. You are treasure. And I love you. And I believe in you. Check this out. I think oftentimes in the church, you don't want to look like you don't have it all together. So it's easy for others to look at these women in the sex industry and say, oh, them, they're broken. Until I started ministering and working with women, 
It wasn't until then that I realized that I was broken myself. God showed me that we were created for Him and created for others. And when I was in my career, if you will, I was living for myself. I'm in need of God's grace just as much as the prostitute that I meet Thursday night. I don't think that anybody's brokenness out there could keep them from being whole. I've seen that with women that I sit with every single day. Every single day, the women that are sexually abused and they feel like they have been shattered for the rest of their lives, I've seen God make them whole again. Friends, when we come to the end of ourselves and see the poor in spirit the way Jesus sees the poor in spirit, we begin to realize that we are poor in spirit too. Amen? And then you go, Chris, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? It means to realize that you are broken. Oh, it's not to like to figure out why you're broken. It's not, it's not going down that road. It's just realizing that you are broken. And I'm here to tell you something really simply. It's okay to be broken. It's okay. And I know you and I try every day to get up and go into work and go into our families and go into our friendships and we present and project this image that we have it all together. Sure, every once in a while we'll give them, give them a little bit of thing, like, hey, can you pray for me about this? Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Boom, back on again. Okay, we're, gonna, we're good. We're going to go back into that, that environment, making sure we look good. We're projecting something that, of confidence, something that, that's good, that they can relate with or maybe respect, hopefully. That's what you're hoping for. But I'm telling you what, Jesus, we cannot do this with him. We can't. We shouldn't be this way dealing with each other. But I'm telling you what, what's so easy for us is that it's a, it's a simple step to projecting this way to people. I'm good. I'm good. And we go to God. I'm good, God. I'm good. I'm good. I don't, I don't need much of you. I'm not that broken. Friends, after understanding the end of me is the beginning of a new identity, which is point number two, point number three is this. The end of me is the beginning of God's power. This is the last point. The beginning of God's power. And the story's not done yet. Luke 7, this whole, Jesus goes into the, he just really, he really defends the woman with this Pharisee and all those who are listening. And he says this in a wrap-up. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, ouch. But I think she'd be in good company with us, wouldn't she? Have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Forgiven. And again, going back to if you and I are, are projecting this like, I got it, I got it, I'm not that bad, I'm not that bad, I'm not that bad. And we bring it to God, I got it, I got it, I'm not that bad, I'm not that bad. And God's like, would you let me just heal all of you? Would you just let me forgive all of you? Why are you holding back these sins? Why are you holding back these things you're not letting me have? And I'm telling you what, have you ever thought about this? The reason why your relationship with God is not as intimate, is not as good, is not as, as, as wonderful as you hope and pray it would ever be, maybe the reason why it's not that great is because you haven't been that open with him. And you haven't given him at all. You're holding it back. You're saying, I only need to be forgiven for a few things, God, but let's be honest. You've got to be forgiven for all of them. And God's not, and I swear, I mean, you shouldn't swear, Chris. Oh, you're right, okay, I swear. God, I, I don't swear. God, I, I, God's just like, what are you doing? Why are you holding back? Why, do you think this projection is what I want? I know the real you and love you because of the real you. But you need to let go of this stuff. You need to drop the act for yourself, not myself. Friend. We see this played out in the disciples' lives. All of these schmoes that follow Jesus, encounter Jesus, this schmo as well. Their brokenness was on display more and more. It wasn't just a, a, a one time in their life. It was more and more of showing their brokenness. And it's okay to be broken. And for all of the believers in the room, if you've been a believer for more than 20 years, thank you. If you've been, been a believer for more than 30 years, thank you. If you've been a believer for more than 40 or 50 years, Thank you. I wouldn't be here without you. But I'm telling you right now what I need, what I need from you. I don't need, I'll start with that, you to show me how generous you are. I don't need you to show me how much of a servant you are. 
I don't need to show, you need to show me how you've learned to control your mouth and not cuss as much as you used to. I don't need you to show me those things. What I need you to show me, mature believer, is that you are still broken and you're running to Jesus daily. But Chris, aren't we supposed to be made whole? Doesn't he make us whole? Oh, yeah, he does. He does. But again, our schmoness sends us going back often. But it made me think about this. Have you ever heard of this, this phrase, kintsugi? Say it with me. One, two, three. Kintsugi. One more time. One, two, three. Kintsugi. Now with drama flair, okay? One, more, one, two, three. Kintsugi. Yeah, that's what I want, okay? Kintsugi. Kintsugi, you know, what is this? It's actually a Japanese art form about 500 years old. And if you look at this thing, you go, okay, Chris, it probably looks like something to do with, like, pottery, but with some gold lines. Actually, what it is, it's, it's this little piece of art behind me is worth, I don't know, uh, 11 grand. 11 grand. This thing. What? It, what it is, it's so amazing. It's a restoration pro, uh, a process. It's an art form that highlights brokenness. And, and really, it helps, really highlights the, the brokenness and remember, remembering people, the, the beauty of being broken. That's what it reminds people of. There's a beauty in being broken and brought together again. And even this one in particular, you can see even more. Looking down and around it, you see these gold lines. And it shines and it grabs your attention. That's what grabs your attention. I wish I could have done this. I couldn't figure out how to do it. I was like, ugh. But I'm just going to give you the image. Here we go. I wanted to have a big old pot, okay? A big, like, clay pot, but this big. And I wanted to come over and go, pow, and just knock it. Okay? And in real time, I wanted to take all the pieces, put them back together again, Glue them up, glue them up, glue them up. Use this kind of like this kind of wood sap thing they use and the gold kind of like paint on it too. And I wanted to fix it all for you. Then I wanted to go ahead and put like a, a little lantern in the bottom of it. And then I wanted to kind of put a top on it. And then I wanted to turn the lights off. And what would happen? You'd see the light shining through it. That's what I wanted to do. It didn't happen, but I just described it for you, okay? It would have been so cool. <laughs> it would have been awesome. And just like, you know, a dark room, but the lights would be going everywhere. I would be like, yeah. And then I would have turned the lights back on, just turn the lights back on. I would like, that's what Jesus does right there. <laughs> Shines through our brokenness. Shines through it. But yet so many of us are trying to cover it up. We don't want them to see the brokenness. We think that's the way to go about doing this. But again, Jesus turned things upside down. He's going, no, I want you to show them your brokenness. Because as you show them your brokenness, they're going to see Jesus, the one who makes us whole. Amen? That's why we do it. And this last verse, I'll give it to you. Give me an example of this brokenness, Chris, how Jesus does this. Isaiah 53, but he, is, he was pierced for our rebellion. Jesus was. Crushed for our sins. Jesus was. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us. All of us. Like sheep have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. The end of me is the beginning of God's power. Not just for you, friend. But to, be, but to be made evident for those you surround yourself with. So they may see his power and be drawn to it. The big point today, the gist, if you checked out, here it is, no big deal. When you come to the end of yourself, real life begins. Christians, amen? amen. The challenge is this. Stop pretending that you're not broken. Give your broken pieces to Jesus. Start letting God use you, not the other way around. Let's pray. God, we love you.